I didn't want any more loitering in the shade, and I made haste towards the station. When near the buildings I met a white man, in such an unexpected elegance of get-up that in the first moment I took him for a sort of vision. I saw a high-starched collar, white cuffs, a light alpaca jacket, snowy trousers, a clean necktie, and varnished boots. No hat. Hair parted, brushed, oiled, under a green-lined parasol held in a big white hand. He was amazing. I shook hands with this miracle, and I learned he was the company's chief accountant, and that all the bookkeeping was done at this station. He had come out for a moment, he said, to get a breath of fresh air. The expression sounded wonderfully odd, with its suggestion of sedentary desk life. I wouldn't have mentioned the fellow to you at all, only it was from his lips that I first heard the name of the man who is so indissolubly connected with the memories of that time. Moreover, I respected the fellow. Yes, I respected his collars, his vast cuffs, his brushed hair. His appearance was certainly that of a hairdresser's dummy, but in the great demoralization of the land he kept up his appearance. That's backbone. His starched collars and got-up shirt-fronts were achievements of character. He had been out nearly three years, and later I could not help asking him how he managed to sport such linen. He had just the faintest blush, and said modestly, "'I've been teaching one of the native women about the station. It was difficult. She had a distaste for the work.' Thus this man had verily accomplished something and he was devoted to his books, which were in apple-pie order. Everything else in the station was in a muddle, heads, things, buildings. Strings of dusty natives with splay feet arrived and departed, a stream of manufactured goods, rubbishy cottons, beads, and brass wire were sent into the depths of darkness, and in return came a precious trickle of ivory. I had to wait in the station for ten days an eternity. I lived in a hut in the yard, but to be out of the chaos I would sometimes get into the accountant's office. It was built of horizontal planks and so badly put together that, as he bent over his high desk, he was barred from neck to heels with narrow strips of sunlight. There was no need to open the big shutter to see. It was hot there, too. Big flies buzzed fiendishly, and did not sting, but stabbed. I sat generally on the floor, while, of faultless appearance, and even slightly scented, perching on a high stool, he wrote, he wrote. Sometimes he stood up for exercise. When a truckle bed with a sick man, some invalid agent from up-country, was put in there, he exhibited a gentle annoyance. The groans of this sick person, he said, distract my attention, and without that it is extremely difficult to guard against clerical errors in this climate. One day he remarked without lifting his head, In the interior you will no doubt meet Mr. Kurtz. On my asking who Mr. Kurtz was, he said he was a first-class agent, and seeing my disappointment at this information, he added slowly, laying down his pen, he is a very remarkable person. Further questions elicited from him that Mr. Kurtz was at present in charge of a trading post, a very important one, in the true ivory country, at the very bottom of there, sends in as much ivory as all the others put together. He began to write again. The sick man was too ill to groan. The flies buzzed in a great peace. Suddenly there was a growing murmur of voices and a great tramping of feet. A caravan had come in. A violent babble of uncouth sounds burst out on the other side of the planks. All the carriers were speaking together, and in the midst of the uproar the lamentable voice of the chief agent was heard giving it up tearfully for the twentieth time that day. He rose slowly. What a frightful row, he said. He crossed the room gently to look at the sick man, and returning, said to me, He does not hear. What, dead? I asked, startled. No, not yet. 
he answered with great composure. Then, alluding with a toss of the head to the tumult in the station-yard, "'When one has got to make correct entries, one comes to hate those savages, hate them to the death.' He remained thoughtful for a moment. "'When you see Mr. Kurtz,' he went on, "'tell him from me that everything here,' he glanced at the deck, "'is very satisfactory. I don't like to write to him.' With those messengers of ours, you never know who may get hold of your letter at that central station. He stared at me for a moment with his mild, bulging eyes. Oh, he will go far, very far, he began again. He will be a somebody in the administration before long. They, above, the council in Europe, you know, mean him to be. He turned to his work. The noise outside had ceased, and presently in going out I stopped at the door. In the steady buzz of flies the homeward-bound agent was lying finished and insensible. The other, bent over his books, was making correct entries of perfectly correct transactions, and fifty feet below the doorstep I could still see the treetops of the grove of death. Next day I left that station at last with a caravan of sixty men, for a two-hundred-mile tramp. No use telling you much about that. Paths pass everywhere, a stamped-in network of paths spreading over the empty land, through the long grass, through burnt grass, through thickets, down and up chilly ravines, up and down stony hills ablaze with heat, and a solitude, a solitude. Nobody, not a hut. The population had cleared out a long time ago. Well, if a lot of mysterious natives armed with all kinds of fearful weapons suddenly took to travelling on the road between Deal and Gravesend, catching the yokels right and left to carry heavy loads for them, I fancy every farm and cottage thereabouts would get empty very soon. Only here the dwellings were gone too. Still I passed through several abandoned villages— there's something pathetically childish in the ruins of grass walls. Day after day, with the stamp and shuffle of sixty pair of bare feet behind me, each pair under a sixty-pound load. Camp, cook, sleep, strike camp, march. Now and then a carrier dead in harness, at rest in the long grass near the path, with an empty water-gourd and his long staff lying by his side. A great silence around and above, Perhaps on some quiet night the tremor of far-off drums, sinking, swelling, a tremor vast, faint, a sound weird, appealing, suggestive, and wild, and perhaps with as profound a meaning as the sound of bells in a Christian country. Once a white man in an unbuttoned uniform, camping on the path with an armed escort of lank Zanzibaris, very hospitable and festive, not to say drunk, was looking after the upkeep of the road, he declared. Can't say I saw any road, or any upkeep, unless the body of a middle-aged negro with a bullet hole in the forehead, upon which I absolutely stumbled three miles farther on, may be considered as a permanent improvement. I had a white companion, too. Not a bad chap, but rather too fleshy, and with an exasperating habit of fainting on the hot hillsides, miles away from the least bit of shade and water. Annoying, you know, to hold your own coat like a parasol over a man's head while he is coming too. I couldn't help asking him once what he meant by coming there at all. To make money, of course. What do you think? he said scornfully. Then he got fever and had to be carried in a hammock slung under a pole. As he weighed sixteen stone, I had no end of rows with the carriers. They jibbed, ran away, sneaked off with their loads in the night. Quite a mutiny. So one evening I made a speech in English with gestures, not one of which was lost to the sixty pairs of eyes before me, and the next morning I started the hammock off in front all right. An hour afterwards I came upon the whole concern wrecked in a bush. Man, hammock, groans, blankets, horrors. The heavy pole had skinned his poor nose. 
He was very anxious for me to kill somebody, but there wasn't the shadow of a carrier near. I remembered the old doctor. It would be interesting for science to watch the mental changes of individuals on the spot. I felt I was becoming scientifically interesting. However, all this is to no purpose. On the fifteenth day I came in sight of the big river again and hobbled into the central station. It was on a backwater surrounded by scrub and forest, with a pretty border of smelly mud on one side, and on the three others enclosed by a crazy fence of rushes. A neglected gap was all the gate it had, and the first glance at the place was enough to let you see the flabby devil was running that show. White men with long staves in their hands appeared languidly from amongst the buildings, strolling up to take a look at me, and then retired out of sight somewhere. One of them, a stout, excitable chap with black moustaches, informed me with great volubility and many digressions, as soon as I told him who I was, that my steamer was at the bottom of the river. I was thunderstruck. What? How? Why? Oh, it was all right. The manager himself was there. All quite correct. Everybody has behaved splendidly, splendidly. You must, he said in agitation, go and see the general manager at once. He is waiting. I did not see the real significance of that wreck at once. I fancy I see it now. But I am not sure, not at all. "'Certainly the affair was too stupid, when I think of it, to be altogether natural, still. "'But at the moment it presented itself simply as a confounded nuisance. "'The steamer was sunk. "'They had started two days before in a sudden hurry up the river with the manager on board, "'in charge of some volunteer skipper, "'and before they had been out three hours they tore the bottom out of her on stones.' and she sank near the south bank. I asked myself what I was to do there now my boat was lost. As a matter of fact, I had plenty to do in fishing my command out of the river. I had to set about it the very next day. That, and the repairs when I brought the pieces to the station, took some months. My first interview with the manager was curious— "'He did not ask me to sit down after my twenty-mile walk that morning. "'He was commonplace in complexion, in features, in manners, and in voice. "'He was of middle size and of ordinary build. "'His eyes, of the usual blue, were perhaps remarkably cold, "'and he certainly could make his glance fall on one as trenchant and heavy as an axe. "'But even at those times the rest of his person seemed to disclaim the intention.' Otherwise, there was only an indefinable, faint expression of his lips, something stealthy, a smile, not a smile. I remember it, but I can't explain. It was unconscious, this smile was, though just after he had said something it got intensified for an instant. It came at the end of his speeches like a seal applied on the words to make the meaning of the commonest phrase appear absolutely inscrutable. He was a common trader, from his youth up employed in these parts, nothing more. He was obeyed, yet he inspired neither love nor fear, nor even respect. He inspired uneasiness. That was it, uneasiness. Not a definite mistrust, just uneasiness, nothing more. You have no idea how effective such a a faculty can be. He had no genius for organising, for initiative, or for order even. There was evidence in such things as the deplorable state of the station. He had no learning and no intelligence. His position had come to him. Why? Perhaps because he was never ill. He had served three terms of three years out there. Because triumphant health in the general rout of constitutions is a kind of power in itself. When he went home on leave, he rioted on a large scale, pompously, jack ashore, with a difference in externals only. This one could gather from his casual talk. 
He originated nothing. He could keep the routine going, that's all. But he was great. He was great by this little thing, that it was impossible to tell what could control such a man. He never gave that secret away. Perhaps there was nothing within him. Such a suspicion made one pause, for out there there were no external checks. Once when various tropical diseases had laid low almost every agent in the station, he was heard to say, "'Men who come out here should have no entrails.' He sealed the utterance with that smile of his, as though it had been a door opening into a darkness he had in his keeping. You fancied you had seen things, but the seal was on. When annoyed at mealtimes by the constant quarrels of the white men about precedence, he ordered an immense round table to be made, for which a special house had to be built. This was the station's mess-room. Where he sat was the first place, the rest were nowhere. One felt this to be his unalterable conviction. He was neither civil nor uncivil. He was quiet. He allowed his boy, an overfed young negro from the coast, to treat the white men under his very eyes with provoking insolence. <laughs>